I should say that uh, the very first time I heard Eduardo Bellotti play uh, the organ, I believe it was in Gothenburg, and I walked into his concert late. The room was dark, he was playing, I had no program, and I sat down and I thought, now what could he be playing? It has to be Frescobaldi. I know it's Frescobaldi, but I can't put my finger on exactly which piece of Frescobaldi it was. Well, when the lights came on and I found out what I was listening to, he was improvising. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, he sure fooled me into thinking that Frescobaldi was sitting at that keyboard. And so he is our beloved uh, professor of organ uh, at uh, Eastman School of Music, and he is going to tell us some of the magical secrets today as unfolded uh, by uh, Bancieri. He has just published a new edition of this seminal uh, piece of literature in organ performance and theory from the early 17th century, L'Organo Suonarino, and uh, he will tell us about that today. Eduardo, thank you. Thank you. The tricks of the trade, working with Adriano Banchieri and L'Organo Suonarino. Adriano Banchieri was born in 1568 and uh, died in 1634, and was one of the most influential Italian composers and theorists of his time. Born in Bologna, he was a Benedictine monk, and everybody knows his name because he occupies an important place in the history of music, together with Orazio Vecchi, as composer of madrigal comedies, and staged but dramatic collection of madrigal, which, when sung consecutively, told the story. Among them, there is Barca di Venezia per Padua, La Pazzia Senile, and others. Here is our guy. <laughs> Des despite being a monk, Banchieri was an eclectic and extroverted person. He composed poetry in the Bolognese vernacular language, and in 1620, together with Giulio Cesare Croce, he published the novels of Bertoldo, Bertoldino, and Cacasenno. The narrative principle is the contrast between the simple life of the peasants and the contriving useless life of the courtiers. It's a kind of antithesis against Castiglione il Cortegiano, published one century earlier. Uh, Bertoldo, the personage, is the rough peasant, but rich of wisdom, wit, and common sense against come the idea of wit. Banchieri was also known as a theorist and a teacher, and he published a large number of texts on theory and practice of music. Although L'Organo Suonarino is cited extensively in the scholarly literature on organ and liturgical practice in the 17th century and has been the subject of several dissertations, the lack of a modern critical edition has prevented the knowledge and the practical use of this source of considerable historical and pedagogical importance. The new critical edition I published seeks to bring this remarkable book to a wider musical community. The volume, as, be, as Carola says, uh, recently published in the series Tastatura, an important collection of Italian keyboard music created by the Istituto dell'Organo Storico Italiano in Rome. And I'm very pleased that, that here we have today Armando Carideo, who is the director of the Istituto. In this book, in L'Organo Suonarino, we find not only an incredible amount of information about liturgical practice and organ playing in the early 17th century, but also a large collection of versetti and pieces for the Catholic service, and a powerful teaching tool delivering the trick of the trade for the organist, how to accompany the plain chant, improvise verses, and compose pieces with all the skills of the art of counterpoint. We have, as you can see, three editions, all printed in Venice, and this edition demonstrates the importance of this work. 
The first, in a quarto format, was printed in 1605. It is comprised of three of five, sorry, five registry stops. He, Banchieri named the chapter stop, like the, the stops of the organ, and uh, 128 pages. The second was published in 1611 in folio format, large format, 108 pages. And this edition, I uh, add a lot of widespread cuts, modification, and addition, particularly in the section dedicated to the basso continuo in the fifth chapter. And finally, the third edition, printed in 1622 and reprinted posthumously in 1638, is the most extensive with 164 page, six registry stops or chapters, and appendix containing the Mesa della Domenica written in two parts. To understand the importance of the Organo Suonarino, brief mention should be made of another Banchieri's theoretical work, the Conclusioni nel Suono dell'Organo, published in Bologna in 1609. In my opinion, the 12th conclusion contains the most comprehensive presentation of the art of organ playing in the 16th and 17th century. Here I start uh, my quote. Four styles found in the art of organ playing, fantasia, intavolatura, spartitura, and basso. In the fantasia, one must be familiar with modes and their assigned rules. Counterpoint, the art of fugal writing at the fourth and the fifth, and lastly, study many composition in the formation of a healthy intelligence, as well as in the search for inspiration. In the intavolatura, one must, besides the above mentioned conditions, study them well in order to play them correctly. It is true that many would declare themselves competent organists barely apply themselves to this discipline. In the spartitura, one must be able to read in all clefs, be familiar with B-flat and B-natural, in other words, with the hexachord, have a good ear, ear hands and eyes, and those whose uh, eyesight is not very good should have sound intelligence and should follow the bass part, realizing it, as it will be shown in the following comment on the basso continuo. And lastly, the basso seguente, or basso continuo, widely practiced. Since it is easy to do, or Banchieri thinks it's easy to do, many organists today are successful in its realization but blinded by their own vainglory in their confidence of being able to release a bass, they neglect the difficult study of the fantasia and spartiture, whose practice surely has immortalized many worthy musicians. Soon, again Banchieri says, there will be two classes of performers, the organist, who pursues the correct study of fantasie and spartiture, and the bassisti, bass players, full of slothfulness, who are content simply to play the bass, tanquam asinus ad liram, like a donkey with a lute." <laughs> End quote. It is important to underline that for Banchieri, along with all other theories of this time, the basso seguente was not simply a succession of chords of a sort of vertical reading of the score, but rather it was deeply in bed of the art of counterpoint, without which it lacks rules and substance. In L'Organo Suonarino, Banchieri appears to utilize three of these four styles. Spartitura, in the sonatas, at the end of each chapter, that are written in full score. Basso continuo, for the versetti to improvise in alternation with playing chant. And fantasia, as the final goal in training the performer working with, on spartiture and basso continuo in the true art of improvisation. Only the intabulation is missing, for which Banchieri specifically directs the reader to another contemporary book published in the same period, Di Rutas il Transilvano, where the discussion of intabulation is very large and very deep. Now we go to the content of L'Organo Suonarino. We give a look to the table of content, and starting from the top, you see the first registro or first chapter, you have the organ mess, explanation, about the figure base, 
And then you have Messa della Madonna, Sunday Mass, Messa della Domenica, Messa della Virgin Mary, Messa dell'Avvento, the sequences, Victime Pascali Laudes, Veni Sante Spiritus, Lauda Sion, so all the verses for the whole liturgical year, and then at the end, a sonatas in different styles, written in full score. And then this tabella ordinata, a table where you find very detailed describe the duty of the organist, when the organist and what the organist had to, has to play during the service. In the second registro, second chapter, we have the explanation of the eight church modes, tones and cadences, and then we have the collection of all the psalmi vespertinis, all the psalms, again written like a Toro bass, and then eight faux bordon, and then five sonatas in different styles. And then in the third chapter, all the hymn for the uh, whole liturgical year, Te Deum. And then in the first chapter, the Egg Magnificat, written in two parts, and four capricci and two Deo Gracias, short conclusion of the service. And then finally, in the fifth chapter, all the antiphons of the Blessed Virgin, Alma Redentoris Mater, Ave Regina Celorum, Regina Celi, Salve Regina. And at the very end, a long normal organisti, another table, with all the list of the liturgical festivity from the first Sunday of Advent to the last Sunday after Pentecost. And for each festivity, you have listed in which tone the Magnificat must be sung and improvise, in which tone and, uh, the hymn is sung, and which mass you have to use. So it was a really hand uh, book for organists to know what they have to do day by day during the whole liturgical year. So practically, if you look, we have three different kind of uh, material in this book, uh, explanations, basso seguente, and spartitura. And now we are briefly going to give a look to one for each, one example for each of them. And we start with the first, that is the tabella ordinata, is this explanation about the role of the organist. This document is very important because it's one of the few complete documents you have that uh, help us in perform correctly the alternation in the Catholic Mass in the 16th and 17th century. What you find here allowed you and help you in correctly understanding Fiore Musicali by Frescobaldi, as well as the collection of Claudio Merulo, Andrea Gabrieli, and other composers of the 16th and 17th century who wrote verses for the Mass. So through this table, you understand how to organize this music and how to use this music during the Mass. I start from the top, a table, for the beginning organist concerning the time when they must play during the masses with canto fermo, with plain chant. First, when the choir finish the sicuterat of the introitus, the organist has to start the kyrie. And then, after the gloria in excelsis is intoned by the priest, the organist has to answer alternatively to the choir. And then, at the end of the epistle, the organist has to play a short ripieno, or fugue. If necessary, after the verse, the organist has to play an answer to the Alleluia. And then, after the credo is intoned, the organist reply alternatively, if it's customary. The question of the credo in Banchieri is related to the reform of the Council of Trent, uh, because of the Important, the doctrinal importance of the credo, the Council of Train discourage organists in apply the alternative in the credo because all the texts must be sung, must be understandable because of his uh, doctrinal content. And so Banchieri says, not, is no more in use like in the early Renaissance to play the alternation, to play verses in alternation with the credo text. The Oremus having been said, the organist play a motet or richer cutter until the priest turns and says oratre fratres. So this is the offertory. And it's very interesting because there are other 
parallel sources that prove that the offertory was very long and was very important in the time. And because of the happening of many things, the organist has to improvise or to play a ricercata of a big piece with the full sound of the organ. And so the most of the ricercate from Fiori Musicali by Frescobaldi must be played with the full sound because they accompany the ceremony of the offertory. And this remains also later, organists know very well, when you play offertoire sur le grand jeu in the French tradition, you have again the same situation. You play with the full organ because while the organist is playing, there is a procession of people uh, taking money and other things and uh, moving to the altar to bring to the altar the bread and the wine and all was necessary for the Eucharistic part uh, of the Mass. For the Santos, the organist played twice, very briefly, and then played for the elevation something softly and with gravity to move to devotion. This is another one of the first documents, 1605, speaking about this toccata per l'elevazione, or anyway, elevation piece, that might be played, improvised by the organist to create this atmosphere of sadness, this contemplation of Christ on the cross. After the answer to the Pax Domini, the organist played the Agnus Dei. After the second Agnus has been sung by the choir, play a capriccio or aria alla francese that must be pleasant. And this is also very interesting for us, is what will happen also in the 18th century and what we will do Saturday in the recreation of the Zipoli Mess. The Agnus Dei was organized in this way. The first Agnus was organ, verse, the second was sung by the choir or the congregation, and the third verse was replaced by the aria francese, or we say canzona dopo il comune. And this is the order that we find also in Frescobaldi. In Frescobaldi we don't have verse for the Agnus Dei, but we have the canzona post il comune that was the third part of the Agnus Dei. After the Missa Est or Benedicamus Domino, the organist play a short ripieno. Why short? It's not because in the time as today very often, and this was my experience in Italy in the Catholic Church, when the priest says, eat a Missa Est, after 10 seconds the church is desert. <laughs> after, I think it has nothing to do with this, but with the fact that in the time of Frescobaldi, in the time of Banchieri, the communion was only for the priests. There was no communion for the congregation, and the communion was distributed outside the official service in a side altar. And so the organists have to conclude with a short Deo Gracias. We find the same in the short Deo Gracias of Couperin or de Grigny, the French tradition, because after that, the people who want to receive the Eucharistic move to a side altar and they are privately receive the Eucharistic. And then at the end, uh, Banchieri writes, I advise those organists who perhaps are not well informed that on the organ you must not play airs for dancing or defile and lascivious madrigals because these melodies were forbidden by the Sacred Council of Trent in the 22nd section. And now we move to the other kind this is the beginning, in this example of Basso Continuo, is the beginning of the Kyrie of the Messa della Madonna. You see, the Basso Seguente is printed in the traditional way, one system with five lines and no bar lines, as in the Renaissance uh, polyphony. Below the system, you can see there, are, there is the text. As Banchieri states in, the, in his introduction, it can be used to sing the bass line while the organist is improvising the other parts. Example of organ verses with the solo voice part are documented in Italy and in Spain in the 16th and 17th century. Analyzing the Kyrie Versetti, we can see that the first utilized the incipit of the Gregorian melody, repeated three times at pitch, Dorian, a fourth lower, and lastly again at pitch. The rhythmic profile of the motif is varied for each entrance, demonstrating the variety of rhythmic figures at the disposal of the composer in the contrapuntal style of his era. 
You see, we have below the same Kyrie from the Graduale de Tempore, the Editio Medicea was published, the official edition was published in 1614, and you can recognize the melody of the Kyrie used in a rhythmical way three times in the first Kyrie. If uh, we try to play this piece, I try, when I was working, I tried to play all the pieces of the collection. And our first reaction is to apply our knowledge of harmony and basso continuo, performing the bass with the left hand and the chords with the right. This manner of realizing, here we have the modern edition, so it's easy to understand. This manner of realizing the basso continuo is certainly effective for repertory of the 18th century where the system of tonality codified by Rameau's theories and represented in the practice of numerous basso continuo manuals structured around the rule of the octave aligns closely with the compositional practice. However, this approach is completely ineffective for Banchieri bass line. And the music of the 17th century in general, which was based on other elements, the modes, cadences, and counterpoint. And here I play is a piano sound, so they're far away from the sound of the time. Uh, the first Kyrie just playing the chords as a normal Toro bass. I think that if the organist improvised in this way, in that time, after 10 minutes, people were sleeping in the church before the beginning of the sermon. So this is not normal, normally. And uh, I believe that this is not the right way to work, particularly if we move to the second Kyrie. If you look carefully at the second Kyrie, the second line, the line above, you see that the beginning is not a basso continuo in the sense that you cannot imagine to have this melody. Two seven jump, even if the seven could be used as Patrick show as a affetto, oime, this is not a oime at this point, <laughs> and it doesn't work. But carefully looking, it's very clear, the change of the clef and also the change of the pitch suggest the entrance of the voices as we can see in the following example. So I try to use this idea, and here we have two verses, the first in three parts, using the entrance as suggested by Banchieri, and the fourth in four parts. The new part is in the uh, third measure when the soprano starts again the imitation of the melody of the Kyrie. And we can try to listen to the music. second version for part. recognize also a kind of cliche in the structure of the versetto, the verse in this time, that is the imitation, the entrance of the four parts, and then in the last line measure for the cadence to the fifth A, because this was the important cadence of the Dorian mode, and then the conclusion is very conventional, applying a sequence the descending stepwise bass sequence with 7-6-7-6, seven, six, seven, six, the typical uh, contrapuntal system of accompanying a descending stepwise line 
in, in the base. In this manner, Banchieri initiated, in my opinion, a practice that would become an important didact didactic method through the 17th and 18th centuries, the partimento, a kind of stenography of a music score that leaves the responsibility of its realization to the adequately trained performer. Of course, the term partimento was born later, the late 17th century in Rome, and then developed in Naples in the 18th century. But it looks like that this short bass by Banchieri in some way moved in the same direction. And we go to the final, the third element of the book. Again, an example. This is the Sonata Ottava in Aria Francese. And you see the full score was published in such a way that you have the two page connected together. So you have to go through the page and then go back in the second line and through the page. And this sonata is very interesting. All the sonatas are interesting. But if we look carefully at it, we can see the sonata ottava explores the different possibilities of a fugal answer. I move to a intabulation. It's easy to see. You can see we have at the beginning, at the top, the first exposition of the subject. And then we have the answer of the alto. is an answer at the fourth. And then goes on with the tenor and the bass. And then you have the cadence. And then you move further at the end of the second line. And you have the second exposition with the same order, soprano, alto, tenor, bass. But in this case, if you look, the answer of the alto is modified with what we say today, the tonal answer, so to stay in the fifth. And also, if you look, the answer is a stretto because the theme comes in the middle of the exposition of the subject. And then at the very end, we have the typical canzona line, instrumental canzona homophonic uh, homorhythmic structure with all the instruments play rhythmically together. So, in the space of just over 20 measures, Banchieri disclosed many secrets of the art of counterpoint and imitation. When Banchieri published L'Organo Suonarino, he was in Verona in the monastic church of Santa Maria in Organo where today you can still see and hear the beautiful organ which still preserves several pipes from Banchieri's time. The wealth of theoretical and practical information found in L'Organo Sonarino concerning the liturgical practice of the post-Tridentine period and the art of improvisation and organ performance does not cease to surprise. As mentioned above, the importance of this text is confirmed by his subsequent publications, in which Banchieri modified the content and added new material, even whole chapters, based on his accumulated teaching experience. Santa Maria in Organo preserves a wonderful Renaissance wooden choir with inlays by Fra Giovanni da Varona. He is one of these uh, inlays in the choir. My time is over, and I'd like to end with this picture, not without underlining that L'Organo Suonarino is aimed for at beginners and experts alike, and present a foolproof method to develop improvisation, I believe extremely useful today. Thank you. as well are going to be looking forward to working with your new edition of Bancari. Um, is that going to be available uh, for, for the students to buy at the bookstore or anything like that? It's not yet available, but as we discussed already, we can arrange to make an order for all the books together and uh, Armando Carrillo can take care of it. Okay, and I want to at this point thank Armando uh, for all the work that he does in publishing this incredible collection of Italian uh, keyboard music uh, for us. This is a treasure uh, of incomparable worth.
Uh, I just have one uh, question I'd like to ask Eduardo. Uh, since he is such a brilliant improviser, I would like him to improvise a, um, uh, a bringing together of this whole wonderful session <laughs> that we have this afternoon uh, and tell us, um, pull together Bacchieri and Frescobaldi and tell us how they relate to one another. Yeah, I think there are many, many things that can be related. I think the first is the fact that in Fresco Valley is very clear, as Armando also underlined this morning during the, the master class, that Fresco Valley always push uh, organists to use the full score. Because in the full score, you understand perfectly the polyphony, the structure. And so here is the same. Banchieri push in this direction and, and recommend to look at these sonatas and to work on this sonata because each sonata is a very short piece but with a lot of secrets about uh, the art of composing, the art of performing. So this is an uh, element. The second element, of course, is uh, in the idea, also the liturgical idea, Banchieri, and thanks to Banchieri, we can understand much better how to deal with the liturgical piece in Fresco Valley. And especially Fiori Musicale. Especially Fiori, Fiori Musicale, because there are many, many explanations. Uh, some of them I try to, to use during my, my lecture. And I believe also there is a third uh, element that is the use of the affective. Mm -hmm. It's a side part I didn't discuss very much. But looking at these sonatas, we have some of the sonatas in which it looks like Banchieri want to make a kind of table of different rhetoric figures. A little bit like Caccini in Le Mole Musiche, he does for, for the singers, and Banchieri does for the organist. There is a sonata, I don't remember, it's the number five and the number six, is a kind of elevazione, where it looks like in 20 measures you have the pretty bass, you have the accento, pa, 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 pa. you have the cascata, pim, pa, 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 pa. so all the typical ingredients of the vocal music are transposed, are adapted to the organ. So I think in some way there is also this relationship in the use of the affect. Thank you so much. Are there other questions for Eduardo? This man is going to perform on the organ tonight. Yes. We have in, in uh, just a short time. Uh, this is uh, another display of wonders. <laughs>